point. Don't hesitate, or if you want, as she mentioned, you can wait until the end, but don't feel embarrassed or um, challenged if you want to stop me. That doesn't bother me at least. So welcome to this challenge, and it's all about, well, first of all, warming up, right? This is an actual temperature here this morning, and the wind chill is 44 below, and so they've canceled the bicycle races in Minnesota this morning, just in case you were wondering. There weren't any scheduled, but okay, let's get a little more serious here. Tubing and hose. What this whole uh, webinar is about is showing you how to bend tubing. And I'm gonna do some comparison between hoses and tubing. Obviously hose is flexible. You can get around corners pretty easily, but we can also do the same thing with tubing. And what I'm showing you here is the difference between hose and tubing when it comes to sizing. Look here, here's a three eighths inch piece of tubing and it slides inside the three eighths inch hose. Hose is measured by the ID, tubing by the OD. Even if you go to an automotive parts place and you order a quarter inch tube, the outside of that uh, plastic tubing is gonna be quarter inch. If you order a quarter inch hose, the inside of that plastic piece of material will be quarter inch. So whether it's hose or tubing, that's the difference. They can both be flexible in that case, but for us, the tubing is gonna be rigid and the hose is flexible. It doesn't matter what the wall thickness of the tubing is, the ID will get smaller, but the OD remains the same. Hose is just the opposite. The ID will remain the same and the OD may get heavier. When we're doing tubing, the first thing we need to do is size it. We can't just grab a piece of tubing and say, here we go, this is what you're gonna use. We need to look at the velocity of our fluid going through the lines. And the two examples that I want to use or uh, tune you into is the inlet velocity to a pump and the outlet in a pressure line. So in a vacuum, I like to keep it under three, uh, five feet per second with nice laminar plumbing, no sharp elbows right at the inlet of the pump, a nice pickup on there, and obviously no air leaks or anything like that. And that's really important, the inlet plumbing to a pump. Typically, I like to have it hosed because it gives you the larger ID. We can get the oil in, move it a little slower, and it gets um, more laminar if we aren't moving it quite as fast. Okay, so here we've got a formula, and I'm going to do this. Uh, the formula is 0 0.32 times our gallons per minute divided by the area. Now, this will be the effective area of our tubing or hose. Here's 20 feet per second with three gallons of men. So 0 0.32 times three divided by the 20 feet per second gives us a square inch area of 0 0.048. The formula I like to use is area is diameter squared times 0.7854. You probably have grown up with pi r squared. That also works. The only difference is, is when you find your radius, you have to double it for the diameter because that's how hose and tubing is sold. So once we do that, we take 0.7854 and divide it into 0.048, and then we take the square root of it, and we end up with 0.247. Rounding it off, that would be a quarter inch ID. That would be the size we would need for three gallons a minute. The next thing we wanna look at is the wall thickness. And here's the formula for that. The working pressure is equal to two times the wall thickness times the tensile strength divided by the outside diameter of that tubing, all of that divided by the safety factor. And our standard safety factor in our industry is four to one until we get to 5,000 PSI. And then from 5,000 to 10,000, we'll drop it to three to one. But typically our tubing and hose we should be looking at a four to one. And the tensile strength of 50,000 PSI I came up with, that's what's used in your lightning reference. And if you have your lightning reference handy, I would love to have you follow along with me as we move through some of this, because instead of using these formulas, we can also look it up in the lightning reference that each school was given. Now here's the first one, is how thick a wall do we need? I'm going to blow that up a little bit here. 
And if I look at the quarter inch, we're going to use the number one note. That's the one with the four to one um, safety factor. I'm on page 124 right now of your lightning reference. If you choose, you want to look in that instead. But a quarter inch, if I use a 35,000 wall thickness, these numbers up here are standard wall thickness. This is a uh, kneel drawn over mandrel tubing. Um, many times it's seamless, but it doesn't have to be. But for the quarter inch, this is where I'd go and I see that tubing's good for 3,500 PSI with a four to one safety factor. If I had three eighths inch, it drops down to 2,350. So if I'm working at 2,000 PSI, this is good. But if I'm working at 3,000 PSI, I should boost it up to, and I look up here and I see 049 thousandths. That would be the proper wall thickness for 3H tubing if you're going up to 3,000 PSI or something higher than 2,350. So this is a chart for your advantage to use. The next page, is talking about pressure losses in tubing. And here we have, I'm gonna, oops, I think I jumped two slides. There we go. First, I'm looking at inlet velocities up in the top right corner. And again, I can sh show you if you wanna follow along, this is page 112 in your lightning reference. So for our inlet velocities, five feet per second, let's say you had three gallons a minute, we would have to get way down here someplace. And that would take me up to 5 eighths inch tubing. If I wanted to keep it under, well, that would be for 3.3, actually three feet per second. Try that again, three gallons a minute would be just fine with half inch tubing. Here's a kind of a handy rule of thumb. We calculated a quarter inch was good for three gallons a minute in hose. And since their velocity in a suction line is four times slower, we need to double the area of that quarter inch. And anytime you double the diameter, it's four times the area. It's just kind of a mental note, a half inch hose would handle that three gallons a minute for you on an inlet line. In tubing, it's taken us up to a little bit larger. And the reason I like hose for the inlet of the pump is the flexibility. That pump may twist a little bit as you're uh, pedaling on it. On a regular application, it may vibrate a little bit and it gives you that extra freedom if you use a hose between the pump and the reservoir. But it's your option, it can be plumbed. The next page I'm going to is page 113. Try again, it's jumping on me a little bit. Here we go. And now we're looking at 20 feet per second. And if we move down here to three gallons a minute, we slide over, we could uh, squeak by with a quarter inch hose. But remember we're measuring tubing by the OD. So my rule of thumb is let's automatically boost it to three eighths inch tubing. This is a hose right now. And I'll show you why as we go to the next picture. But I wanted to show you one thing here. And that's over in the upper right hand corner before I move into tubing. You notice the arrow pointing right through a T. Here's our pressure drop of 5.4 PSI. Now, if that's our inlet velocity, that's over the capabilities of the pump. We want to keep our inlet uh, pressure drop in inches of vacuum to less than five inches. Generally speaking, that's about two and a half PSI. So fittings kill us if we're undersized. But here's the, what I really wanted to show you. Look what happens when I go through a T at a right angle. The pressure drop more than triples, 5.4 to 17.18. Again, these numbers you can study yourself a little bit. But so when you're plumbing and you've got a T, put the gauge off the branch and let the oil go straight through the T instead of putting the gauge here and making the oil make a right hand turn. See if you can plumb it straight through and then branch off with your instrumentation. That will give you less pressure drop and make it more efficient. Whoops. 
Okay, I'm trying to jump ahead here. Um, to make sure you've got the sizes. All these pages here, you can look for the uh, tubing, you can look for the hose. And now I'm gonna get into the actual tube bending. So take a little time to study those with your lightning reference. These are some of the tools of a trade. If you're bending larger tubing, here's a tube bender. Here's some of the dies. Down here, you can see a hose cutoff machine. It's an electric motor with a real sh sharp blade here that'll cut off the hose. And here's a machine called a power flare. This is um, for making flat face seal. And this is a high pressure type seal, 6,000 PSI. You're starting to see in something where that's really a zero leak type fitting. It takes the end of the tubing and makes it totally flat. And there's an O-ring that goes on the end of that with that power flare to do that. So that's um, a very expensive machine. Every die that's in here is getting real expensive. They used to be more reasonable. They're closer to $2,000 for every wall thickness and every diameter of tubing. Again, every diameter of tubing takes a different die and every wall thickness of that diameter takes a different set of dies and they're very expensive. So that's not something that a small shop would generally carry. The next one, this is a hydro flare. When we flare our tubing, we put a 37 degree flare on it. And this is a machine that does it hydraulically. Again, it's a more expensive machine, but it's something that the shops will have. Here's one with a hydraulic motor on. I've um, modified my own unit so I don't have to sit there and crank it by hand. So I have a little hydraulic motor on to turn the dies and makes life a lot easier. Here's what you're looking at. You need something like this or some way of flaring the tubing. Here's a, a light duty flare and here's some tube benders. That's what you can get away with. In this corner down here, here's a three eighths tube bender. Here's a quarter inch bender. Here's a flaring machine. And this little device right here has a cone in there on one side and on the other, uh, for doing the inside of the tubing on the back side, you can do the outside of the tubing. I use sometimes a step drill or here's a kind of a deburring type tool and I use with a drill and makes it a whole lot easier. Okay, I've had some questions about fitting size and this is a real confusing area for a lot of people. Oh, they say, you know, you ask for three eighths, wait a minute, what am I getting? A three eighths fitting is really has a thread of nine sixteenths dash 18 when it's an O-ring. O-ring you can usually tell because there's a chamfer up here. So when you look at the three eighths inch, we normally call it a dash six, standing for six sixteenths of an inch. A three quarter inch would be 12 sixteenths of an inch. A quarter inch, four sixteenths. A quarter inch will have a seven sixteenths dash 20 thread. A three eighths or dash six will have a nine sixteenths dash 20. And you get up to odd numbers. Look at this one and one sixteenths dash 12. One and three sixteenths, one and five sixteenths. You know, where in the world am I going to find something like that? That's the standard hydraulic fittings. So you don't have to worry about it. And that's also in your lightning reference. So you don't have to memorize all this. It's just good information that you need to know that when you say, where did I get that fitting? There it is. That's called an ORB or an O-ring boss fitting, sometimes OR. Yeah, or B, excuse me. When we're bending tubing, there's two ways of doing it. One is by the book, and one is the way I'm going to show you. When you do it by the book, you measure out what you need for a length. And let's say you want the first bend to be four inches from the end of the tubing, the next to be three and three quarter, et cetera. If this first bend is 90 degrees and you're using a three eighths inch bender, we look here at the three eighths or the dash six and the bend radius is a 15 sixteenths of an inch and the gain is a half an inch, 0 0.50. What does that mean? It means when I make this bend, I'm gonna have a half an inch tubing left over on the end. If I do three bends here, I'm gonna have 
an inch and a half extra tubing. Now, so this saves you some tubing, especially if you're getting into the larger stainless steel, you can calculate it ahead of time and not be short. But that's what we mean by gain, is that when you bend and you go through this radius here, instead of making a 90 degree square corner, you're gonna have some tubing left over. So that's one that's not in your lightning reference, something that would be a handy one to have a picture of. Okay, I wanna get into the actual tube bending. Here's, a, here's some little application why you really need hose or flexible tubing because it goes through the motions. So I'm gonna start up the video here. Good morning, I'm Ernie Parker, and I'm gonna give you a little demonstration on how to bend tubing and some of the comparisons between hoses and tubing. Hose is easy because it's very flexible and we can move it around and it's important in certain cases, such as mounting to and from a pump for vibration, as I mentioned earlier. Also, it's important for cylinder movement. Here I have a little uh, mini loader with tubing on it. As you can see, there's movement. That would not be a good application for tubing. Tubing is where something is rigid. I'm going to give you an example of that right here. I have a little manifold. And actually it's a valve. It's a six-way valve or more than that. There's eight ports on it. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to plumb this up with a piece of tubing going from one lower port around the corner into an upper port. So we have kind of a complicated bend to make. Okay. We have different fittings. Some of the fittings that you will be using look like this. And what it is is a piece of, or it's a straight thread. I'm going to try and zoom in a little more on this where it's an O-ring on one end and a 37 degree flare on the other end. This is called a straight thread connector. Okay. If you go to the high pressure seals, we have what we call a face seal. There's an O-ring in the end of it. And those are good for 6,000 PSI on this side. You still have the O-ring boss on one side and the um, face seal on the other. One interesting thing about this that most people do not know is that when you're using a face seal fitting like this, you will have one additional thread on the O-ring boss versus when you have a JIC fitting. This is a 3,000 PSI fitting. This is a 6,000 in the smaller sizes here. So you'll have one more thread on there. Otherwise, everything's the same. The threads on this end on the JIC with the uh, 37 degree flare and the O-ring boss are both identical. Okay, now what I could do here is I could put in a 90 degree into this fitting block. And that makes the plumbing a lot easier. And the nice thing about O-ring fittings, you see this jam nut on here? Once you screw that in, and you orientate it the way you want to do it, then you turn the jam nut down and it's anchored in that position. Pipe threads, it never seems to come out right. And they're either too tight or too loose and then over time the stretching and compression, temperature change and everything wears out. You need to go a little bit tighter. You can't do it. Well here with the O-ring boss, you have a jam nut that you can easily tighten down. Instead of doing that, I'm going to screw in a pair of these fittings right here just to make it more difficult to plumb. Screwing that one in on the bottom here, and so I'm on a different plane. I'm screwing this one up here. Now obviously you need to check to make sure the fittings are clean, the valve is clean and all that, and then you tighten it up. I'll get into the torques a little bit later, but now I've got the two fittings here. And I kind of estimated this piece of tubing as one I happen to have, 
and I'm going to show you how to flare it. The first thing, you need to cut it off. You're going to cut it off with a hacksaw, maybe a power saw, and, and there are also tube cutters. And showing you a tube cutter is something that looks like this. Now the problem with the tube cutter is that it leaves a little burr in there. It works very nice. It cuts off nice and straight. You'll just go around the tubing, you clamp it on, and you just keep turning and tightening until it falls off. But it does leave a burr on the end of it. So you're going to have to figure out how you're going to get that off. How do you get that burr off? This is one of the tools that's on the market. It has a cone on the inside and then on the opposite here. So I can go in here and clean it out like this back and forth. Then I turn the tool around and I can deburr the outside. I need to have it all nice and clean and straight at the end. Okay, then you can take a flaring tool. Here's one of them. There's many styles. I've got it set for 3 8 inch. I'll put the tubing in and there's a little stop in here that gets it just the right amount and then you can swing this up and turn it in until you get your flare. Okay, I've got one end already flared. When I get one end flared, the next thing I'm going to do is take a nut and a sleeve. Here's the nut, here's the sleeve. I put them together like this and I put it on the tubing right away before anything else. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I have a little more room to work here. And I want to go from this place right here around, over, up, and in. And I want to keep it all on horizontal pl or vertical planes just for the looks of it to make it a little more difficult to pl uh, plumb. You can go any way you want to do with it. One thing with tubing, never put it in a straight line between two fittings. I'll have a slide to show you with the forces that it has later. So we always want to have a bend in it. Even if we're going up like this, sometimes you need an extra bend for thermal. Here's an example where somebody had a thermal situation. Sometimes you see it on your brakes of your vehicle where they wrapped it up, so that gives it room to expand. The forces are unbelievably strong. Now, I'm going to do this my way, which I think is a lot easier than the book, but I'm going to also show you, or you will see in this presentation, that you can calculate each bend ahead of time. I prefer just to wing it here. Here's a tube bender. This is a 3 8 bender. And for later on, you'll notice that it says a 15 16 radius block on here, right in the handle, I guess it is, if you can see it. Now that's standard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the tubing in like this, and there's various types, and I'm going to go as short as I can. And then I'm going to bend it to the 90 degrees. If you look on the tube bender here, you'll see the marks. Okay, that's my first bend. I'm coming out this way with it and I kind of eyeball it up a little bit and maybe a marker is a good way of going here that we could put a little mark out where we want the bend but we have to remember this was the shortest bend I could do it so I'm going to come out this far with the tubing or I'm not going to be able to bend the last one. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to go a little extra out to where my thumb is. I'm going to put a mark right there and that's where I'm going to make my next bend. And I'll come back. Now I could come up at a diagonal if I wanted to but I'm going to come straight over at this point and make another bend. 
So I'll take, and I always work with the tubing going in from the left side and coming out on the right side. Now where do I get the tubing to bend? How do I get it to bend where I want it to be? This is the key point right here. I want the bend, my mark is right here with my finger, I want it to line up with this part of the tube bender. I'm going to zoom in a little bit with this if I can. This is where the tubing is going to end, right? The middle of the tubing is going to be right here at that 90. So I kind of line up this way to make sure this is straight here. And then I put the effort into it. I go 90 degrees. Look at it. Sometimes you have to overshoot just a little bit. Now I've got a couple of the bends done. It's coming out, it's coming forward. As I lay it out, I see that maybe the bends aren't exactly square. I can take a square and line up and see that last one, I didn't get bent quite far enough. Show you down here, I'm sorry about that. I'll put it back in the tube bender. I'll bend it just a little bit farther until I have my 90. Okay, next step. I look like I want to come up here, so I'm going to actually fasten this tubing on. And I'm going to put a mark lining up right with this. Okay, that's lining up with the fitting. So I really kind of want to have this lined up pretty straight. And in this case, it looks like I'm running out of tubing. I cut it a little bit short. So I guess I'm going to I'm going to raise it up here. My plan was to make an extra bend in there, but I know I'm not going to have enough tubing. So I can take this thing and I'll put a mark on there and I'm going to come in at a different angle. Because I'm coming higher, I'm going to have to offset for that. Is that something we can do? Sure. Again, this is where you can get confused. I'm going to put it into the tube bender from the left side and line up that mark with the edge. The big challenge here now is the angle that I want to come in at. Well, I'm going to come in way over like this. And again, if you want to fasten it here, just briefly, you can line it up with your tube bender. And I'm ready. I've got my angle all lined up. Then I can bend. Now I have my tubing ready. I have to cut it off a little bit. If you can see that, I'm going to lower the camera just a little bit. And you can see I've got a little too much there. I look at that and I say, okay, I need to cut that off. So I can do that. I'll show you with the tube bender. Uh, will the tube bender swing through or probably not? I'm going to go over to the saw. I'll be right back after I cut this off. out cut a little bit long and then 
you're ready. Now if you really have to, you can do a little twisting with this on your own. And now we're ready to flare the last one and put the fittings on. Okay, so I've got to deburr this a little bit. Saws always leave a little burr. I also have a disc sander here that I love using for the outside. Whoops. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit here. Up so you can watch me do this. I'm going to take an air hose. Make sure you have your safety glasses on and blow out any chips. And I'm ready for the final nut and sleeve. Then I always put the nuts and sleeves on before I flare. Except for the very first one. Then I will go ahead and flare that. Put it in our tube flaring machine. Tighten it down. I typically use, I have a Hydra Flare hydraulic one. I typically use that. But when I get all done, you want to make sure that the flare is about the inside of the nut. If you have too small of a flare, it's going to pull out on you, and that could be dangerous. Back to the air hose, again, blow it out, and we're ready to install it. Now, if the bends are off a little bit, the nice thing about tubing is we can flex it just a little bit, and that is perfectly acceptable. And your tubing goes on like that. Okay? So that's pretty much the basic part of tubing. You flare one end, you start to bend. It takes a little practice. If something is off, you could, I'm going to mess this up deliberately here. I guess I didn't mess it up. Something now, oh, the camera shut off. That's what it was. Okay. I did make the one mistake, as you noticed, that I just grabbed a piece of tubing I had, and I didn't measure it out first of all, so I was short on the one bend. But it still gives you an example of how to do that. And it's not that difficult. Make sure you have a little extra tubing with you. Make sure it's hydraulic tubing. It's not something like electrical conduit or anything like that. It needs to be hydraulic tubing, and you're ready to go with that. One, talk about a couple of other things before we close here. And the first one is the coefficient of thermal expansion. I mentioned in the video, never plumb in a straight line. Here's why. For every degree of Fahrenheit change, it changes the length of your tubing by 0 0.0004. That's not much. But if you go 70 degrees, or like this morning, if I had to uh, push snow and I started with a skid steer loader sitting out below zero like this, and it warms up to 180 degrees, you take 180 and add another 30 degrees to a 200 and some degree change in temperature, that's a lot of difference in thermal expansion. Even a cubic inch of oil for every 10 degrees, that's the amount of volume increase per gallon. That's one inch per foot for every 12.6 in steel. But here, look at this. Half inch tubing times a 49,000th wall thickness will produce 952 pounds of force to extend with an increase of 70 degrees. One inch tubing and 95,000th wall thickness has a force of 3,743 pounds per every 70 degree change in temperature. 
years ago, I had plumbed up two hydrostatic pumps together to their case drains with a piece of straight tubing right between the two and made a nice handle for carrying the pump. A year later, it stripped the threads right out of the side of the housing and ruined two pumps because it was plumbed straight instead of putting a little bend in there. So you're not gonna have that kind of trouble here because you're not gonna create enough heat in what you're doing with it. But these are things that you should keep in mind. And if you really have the energy to uh, create a little heat, uh, just put a little bend in the tubing to give it some flexibility. We mentioned that when you're using tubing, that Eaton had a flare seal. Here's a couple of them here. This is what it looks like on the fitting. And that really cuts down the leaks. Oh, I hate to say this, but since these fittings started getting built over in China, the tolerances aren't the same. And especially if you're working with stainless steel, you can really have to torque the nuts hard to get them to stop leaking. And this, um, put this little seal on there and it takes care of the problem for you. So you can go back to normal um, torque numbers without forcing it. Torque specs. Here's a chart I put together. I'm gonna to blow it up a little bit. How tight should we get fitting? So we've been talking three eighths for many of you here. Here it says the nut should be in the neighborhood of 23 to 24 foot pounds of torque. That's for a uh, straight thread O-ring boss. That's that fitting we were screwing into it, uh, into the manifold. And then down here is a JIC. Now this is the flared uh, nut that you're gonna screw on. And it says for a dash six, three eighths inch, 18 to 20 foot pounds is the torque that that nut should get. So the fitting goes in at 23, 24 foot pounds. The uh, swivel nut should be 18 to 20. And you would think that if these were torqued right, when you took them off, the nut would always come loose. Many times when I try to loosen a nut, I have this fitting come loose instead and I have to use two wrenches on it. And that's because they were not torqued. But this is a chart for you. The O-ring uh, seal, different numbers here, metric, uh, British standard pipe uh, threads. So that's all on this page for you to have. Torquing. Now there's various torque wrenches. How in the world do you torque a fitting. Well, one of the ways, this is a tubing um, crow's foot. You notice it actually comes around a little bit. These are real good fittings for doing tubing. They're lo actually a little better than the standard crow's foot. This happens to be a, fits my three inch uh, torque wrench. I have a snap on this that's, ele uh, that's electronic and I can turn it on and adjust it to whatever torque I want. And when I'm pulling that hard, it vibrates. Now, if I put it on the tubing like this, I actually have a little more distance. So it throws your readings off a little bit, not enough to be a problem because it's a fairly long handle. But if you go at right angles, now your torque distance is the right amount. And so that's one of the ways of measuring torque. After you've done a few of them, you probably will get the feel with your hands and you'll be just fine. Most people do not use a torque wrench, but if they're having trouble, maybe if they did, they wouldn't have the leak problems that they do. Here's a tubing wrench. This is, uh, I have a set of these that come in real handy. And I li like this because it opens up and you get around the tubing and then it closes and you've got like a box end wrench. 11 16 just happens to be the standard one for most 3 8 tubing. Eaton has some fittings that's three quarter inch. Okay, last year uh, we had a little oil spill because a couple of fittings weren't crimped properly. If you're questioning them um, and you're using the Earl Quipped hose uh, crimp specs, this is what I have to go with. The three inch hose has a spec that if you measure across the flask, it should be 0.785 inches. This is the number I'm looking for, or 19.94 millimeters. If it's a half inch hose, it should be 9.94 across the flask 
on the crimp. This is on a hose. And so I threw this in for you guys that are using hose. You might want to check on their crimps. If somebody's sneaking in and trying to make your own uh, hose when, and do your own flaring, um, this is what I'm going to be looking for. I will bring a Vermeer caliper along with me and I'll measure some of the crimps and the hoses. I'm assuming they're all professionally done, but if they're not, or you uh, want to slip something under us, just make sure the crimp spec is to the right spec and then there won't be a problem. So that's why I'm including that. Not encouraging you to do your own hose, but for some reason, if something happens or you question what the supplier gave you, check it yourself because I'm going to be looking for that this year. How about any questions? Anything you want me to go back and recover or cover again? I do hope to see some tubing this year because it does be simp uh, is simplified as far as the amount of space it takes up. And again, 3H tubing is going to be good for you. <laughs> I did not hear that. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Mo from Purdue. Uh, if you go back to the second slide, I guess, when you said WP equals two times WT times the tensile over OD. There we go. Yep. Yep. Uh, this is the outside of the diameter. Does it matter if it's a tube or a hose? This is for tubing only. This is only for tubing. Yep. Gotcha. The hose wall thickness is determined by the manufacturer, and you'll have like a 100R1 or a 100R2 hose or something like that. This is for tubing only. This is only for tubing. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Did everyone receive their lightning reference manuals and had a chance to look at them a little bit? I assume that's a yes. Well, I guess this will conclude it. And again, I'll give you my uh, cell phone number and my email. If you have any questions and don't want to bring it up here, don't hesitate to call me. My cell phone number is 952-200-3359. That's 952-200-3359. And my email is Ernie Parker one. I think you have that E R N I E P A R K E R, the number one at msn.com. And I know Stephanie has handed that out to you too. So don't hesitate to contact me if you question your advisor or mentor, or maybe he has a he or she has a question. Contact me. That doesn't uh, hurt at all. We'll put our heads together and figure out and solve your problem for you. And also, if you're having trouble getting your parts in, let me know and maybe I can help. Otherwise, I think this concludes our seminar. And good yeah, luck to I'm all of you. I actually had a quick question. Okay. Um, I was wondering if the, so there was uh, the slide right before the video, you had some specs listed there. Were those in yes. the lightning reference? That's not in there. No. Okay. That's from another sheet. So if you have a camera handy, take a picture of it. Or you can wait okay. until this, um, uh, Stephanie sends you this uh, PowerPoint. This stuff, and this PowerPoint's two gigabytes. It's a huge one. But well, go ahead and take a snapshot. I'll leave it up there. I'll leave it up there for a couple of seconds here and take a picture of that if you'd like. If there's any other pitch uh, slides, let me know and I'll put them up on the screen too.
-hmm. Was there a slide? Um, I just made a couple notes, Ernie. Was there a slide before? Um, there was one right before measuring torque. I think you also had another spec sheet, but I couldn't tell if that was in the lightning reference. Uh, this one is not. This is um, one that I'm uh, rounded up for finding the torques of the um, fittings. This was a hard one to find. I'll blow it up just a little bit because your two that you're looking for is up here and up here. This is the fitting torque and this is the uh, tubing torque. This came from AeroQuip, I believe. I hope some of you are willing to try tubing this year. You stepped out of your shell by trying some manifolds, which is our integrated circuit to hydraulics distribution center. I know Jeff's been working on those for you. Any other comments, questions? Um, Cleveland State confirmed that they got their lightning reference, but all of those were mailed out, um, I want to say, in October. Um, so everyone should have received those. If you haven't, please let me know. Um, and then I think um, Murray State uh, looks like they, they closed for class today because of the weather, I think. But um, if anybody else has anything, please let me know. I'll do the time. Otherwise, we can, we can follow up over email. That works too. All right, everyone, that's it for today. Ernie, thank you so much. Yep, um, I'll uh, send you a note on the side to get that video out to the students. Sounds great. Thanks.